Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to my city, Barcelona. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for their kind invitation. For the next 20 minutes, I will try to give you an overview of uh, the management of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. There's a lot of information, so I will need to go so quickly. So these are my disclosures. So I will start with few background uh, and decision-making criteria uh, for treatment decision in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor patients, then move on with the management of grade one and two peanuts, following um, with the management of grade three uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And finally, I will give you a next slide to try to summarize all the guidelines for advanced neuroendocrine neoplasm. And I think that I will try to success with this summary uh, slide at the end. So uh, we know that, unfortunately, most of our patients will uh, be diagnosed with distant metastasis at the first time. So this means that the major volume of our patients will have distant metastasis in our offices. And during the, last, during the following five years, most of our patients will die due to the disease. So at our first visit with a patient with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, we need to keep in mind at least these five points before taking any decision, uh, treatment decision. Histology, of course, we have in one hand neuroendocrine tumors, well differentiated, grade one and two, and in the other hand, grade three pancreatic, uh, poorly differentiated uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas that are two different, completely different diseases. The functionality, of course, is important. We need to investigate and look for uh, hormone-related syndromes that have a specific treatment. The primary tumor site is also important, and here we will discuss different primary, tumor, uh, different primary tumors with uh, neuroendocrine uh, characteristics, and we know that pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors has, uh, have less survival compared for example, with intestinal ones. The uptake in somatostatin uh, receptor scintigraphy is also important, both for somatostatin analog treatment and for radionucleotide therapy. And of course, tumor burden and extra hepatic disease. One of the most important pronostic factors is GRADE, and you know that GRADE is defined by mitotic count and ki 67 value. And we have these three different groups, GRADE 1, 2, and 3, with different outcome. As you can see here, the survival of these three groups are completely different. With all of this information in our mind, we can create this picture before taking any decision. In one side, tumor burden. In another side, aggressiveness with this great classification, and always taking into consideration this primary uh, origin of the tumor. So with this background, we can move to the manage of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, well-differentiated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, so grade one and grade two. For localized disease, surgery is the only option for cure, and it should be a radical oncologic surgery, and there are few exceptions, small uh, tumors and the most of uh, insulinomas that are usually benign can be treated with more uh, reduced surgery, and we don't have data on adjuvant therapy, so no recommendations should be given here as adjuvant therapy after resection of a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, grade 1 and 2. For distant metastasis, that is the most usual uh, presentation of the disease, surgery may still have a role, and we know that if we can remove almost all the disease, we can have an impact in overall survival. And then we have uh, these local regional treatments in the liver, chemoembolization, embolization, other kinds of ablation like radiofrequency that can be an alternative to surgery, even in concomitant treatment with surgery, and always based on tumor size, anatomical location, and number of metastases. These local regional approaches could be useful also for hormonal control, trying to reduce the release of hormones. And we also know that for those patients with grade one tumors, these approaches could work better and we know that we have a higher recurrence rate for those patients with a ki 67 value over 5%. Another important point in the general management of neuroendocrine tumor patients is symptom 
management, symptoms treatment, we have a specific treatment for hormone release, uh, for hormone related syndromes of peanuts. Um, you know very well somatostatin analogs, but we need to keep in mind, for example, PPIs for gastrinoma, that is the treatment, the standard of care of meta metastatic ga gastrinomas. And after the arrival of febrolimus, also the life of patients with malignant insulinoma has really changed when we can treat this uh, malignant hypoglycemia that these patients suffer. If we move on to current uh, antiproliferative, antiproliferative therapy for grade 1 and 2 pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, we have data on chemotherapy that I will show you in, in the next slide. We have the discussion of this antiproliferative effect of somatostatin analogs, and I will give you a couple of slides to try to answer this question. Of course, PRT, radionuclide therapy, uh, we know that it's active. And at the end, the results of these two big phase three clinical trials with everolimus and sunitinib. So what we know about chemotherapy and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, we have all clinical trials that were performed more than 30 years ago with a low number of patients included in each trial. As you can see here, the data on survival on PFS is lax, so we don't have data on PFS. And the data on overall survival is quite low as expected in these patients. But we can see that it's high it's response rate, and we need to keep in mind that the, the methods that this response rate were evaluated 30 years ago were not resist or who criteria. So we need to keep in mind that information um, in order to interpret this high percentage of response rate of these phase three clinical trials. The results of these trials allowed the approval of streptozotazine in the management of these patients. We have other prospective clinical trials, phase two with lower number of patients with temozolamide combination. The activity of this drug, um, it seems at least promising, so we will see in further and in future larger clinical trials, the real uh, impact of this drug in the management of these patients. And what we have in neuroendocrine tumors is a lot of retrospective data, and we have several clinical or cohorts, retrospective cohorts, with different kinds and combinations of chemotherapy. And as you can see here, uh, the overall survival and progression-free survival is more similar than, we, than the, the data reported with phase three clinical trial with targeted, targeted therapies. So it's more uh, similar to, uh, to the, um, the day by day um, clinics. And the response rate is significantly lower compared with the pivotal phase three trials. So this means that probably this retrospective data shows you a better reality of this efficacy, uh, of the efficacy of these uh, chemotherapy combinations. If we move to somastatin analogs, we know the mechanism and the pathways involved after activation of, the, of these receptors, and we know well which are involved in the uh, control of hormone release. What we know also is that the activation of these receptors through this G protein complex uh, activates several phosphatases that are able to block some of the key uh, players of the main uh, intracellular pathways related with carcinogenesis. You can see here the MAP kinase pathway that it could be uh, blocked with the activation of somatostatin analogs. So we have some rationale to understand this cell cycle arrest with somatostatin analogs and the increase of apoptosis. The clinical data is scarce, so we have few data, uh, few prospective data, some retrospective data. And in patients with progressive disease, that this is the left uh, table, we can see around 50% of this disease stabilization in these patients that, are, that were on disease progression before starting treatment. So I, in my opinion, I think that something it's working there. I think that uh, this growing control of somatostatin analogs is there and should be demonstrated in prospective clinical trials. And we are waiting the results of the biggest clinical trial in this setting, that this is clarinet study, that is expected to, to be presented to, to have the data by, by the end of this year. Uh, it will be a, a specific presentation uh, after, after my presentation of PRT, but we know that this is an active treatment. There are several cohorts reported with um, a good 
partial response rate. We know that those patients that respond uh, had, a good, uh, had a better outcome. And this, in my opinion, I think that this should be demonstrated uh, in, in a prospective way in a phase three trial to try to know which is the real role of this uh, approach for the treatment of patients with advanced pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And finally, the targeted therapies, you know, sunitinib trial and nevrolimus trial. Both studies were published at the same ESI at the beginning of 2011 in New England Journal of Medicine. Here you can see a summary of both designs that they are pretty similar. Patients with well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors of pancreatic origin were included in these uh, two clinical trials. Both were placebo-controlled. And here you have a summary of the primary endpoint of both trials that were progression-free survival. And you can see here this, 60, this around 60% of risk reduction in tumor progression when patients were on treatment and doubling the median progression-free survival. This uh, good data allowed the approval of both drugs in this setting. And as you can see on, in, the, in the back of the, of the slide, uh, most of patients get benefit from the drugs in terms of re reducing tumor load, but only few of them reach this criteria of, res of partial response by, by resist. So this means that resist criteria, partial responses were around 5 and 10 percent. So up today, we have two phase three clinical trials in PNEDs, in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor rate one and two. The, the, the clarinet study, that as I said before, we are waiting the results by the end of the, of the year. And the sector study that will be the first international INEDS and Spanish group GEMME uh, study, prospective study, that will try to assess which is the best uh, sequence of treatment if we start with chemotherapy followed by Everlimus or vice versa, Everlimus followed by chemotherapy. And this study is started to, is ready to, to start recruitment. But the future, the future, uh, it seems that will be really spectacular in neuroendocrine tumor setting. Day by day, we know more and more about pathogenesis and molecular aberrations that are related with, the, with this pathogenesis, with this creation of neuroendocrine tumors. And day by day, new targeted therapies are entering in clinical trials. So I think that the future uh, seems to be amazing in this, in this setting, and, and we will have a lot of uh, information and data. If we move to grade three, a, different, a completely different disease, but including the same umbrella, here you can see uh, an immunostaining of ki 67 and it's, the difference is, is clear. You, you can see here a grade one neuroendocrine tumor, a grade two, and what means grade three, highly aggressive tumor with, as I showed you before, uh, uh, worst prognosis. Surgery. It's the main treatment for localized disease, and you uh, cannot operate those patients with distant metastasis. So we, can, we need to separate grade one and grade two compared to grade three. So no indication of surgery of liver metastasis in these patients. Although we don't have data of adjuvant therapy uh, in, in grade three neuroendocrine tumors due to their similarity to small cell lung cancer, in some cases, chemotherapy or radiotherapy should be considered as adjuvant therapy. And no role of local regional therapies, as I said before, somatostatic analogs, interferon, or PRT. The only active combination that we have, and this is the standard uh, treatment in first line, is combination of cisplatin etoposide, like a small cell lung cancer. We have a high, a relatively high response rate, less than a small cell lung cancer, with short duration, and the overall survival is, always, uh, is, is also uh, short. The last line, the Wallin study, you can see here a new combination of temozolamide, capsitabine, plus bevazizumab. Maybe these new combinations with antiangiogenics and new drugs will have a, could have a role in these in this patients. We will see. We need further um, prospective and larger clinical trials to assess this, this effectiveness. And finally, I will try to give you a summary slide. OK, let's start. For patients with grade one and grade two pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, we need to look at the functionality. If they are functional, so hormone-related uh, syndromes, they have a specific treatment. 
And we need to keep in mind that local regional therapies could help to reduce uh, hormone release in these patients. Special words should be given for insulinoma with arrival of eperolimus and the specific treatment not only for growing control but also for the control of hypoglycemia. For those patients with non-functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, we have one group of patients with high volume of disease, more aggressive with a relatively high Ki67, always in this umbrella of grade one and two, mainly grade two uh, neuroendocrine tumors, uh, with more aggressiveness that should be treated at first line with chemotherapy. Why? So I do not believe that streptozotazine combinations can reach 70% of partial responses, but maybe this 30, 35% is more uh, realistic. Even that, it's a higher response rate compared to Everimos or sunitinib. So uh, we need to prevent this organ failure with this response rate. After that, we have targeted therapies to be offered to these patients. The other extreme of the line is, are those patients that have no progression, you follow them and no progress, that have a low, low aggressiveness and low, low tumor burden. So here, a wait and see politics could be applied. The role of somastatin analogs, I think that it should be demonstrated. So uh, we need to wait the clarinet study, but maybe they will have a role in this, in this, in this group of patients. At disease progression, we can choose other options depending on this disease progression. And there are a middle, that, there are a group of patients that in the middle, so uh, these, these, two, these patients that are slowly progressing, that have a relatively high but not very high tumor board and tumor load, that has a medium Ki67, or those patients that are not able to receive chemotherapy uh, at first line, I think that we have enough data with two phase three clinical um, studies to offer these patients targeted therapies at first line. And probably, and this should be demonstrated, the sequential treatment may be um, the best option in most of these patients. So one first and the other second, or, and vice versa. And always keeping in mind local regional therapies, other combinations with new chemotherapies that uh, have demonstrated some interesting uh, results, and of course, PRT, where uh, it's available. For pancreatic neuroendocrine carcinomas, grade three, we have cisplatin and antoposite out of clinical trials. So we have, as you can see here, a uh, few options. So in conclusion, uh, the new WHO classification has, has separately very well two different diseases, neuroendocrine tumors. So we can talk about neuroendocrine tumors of those grade one and grade two and neuroendocrine carcinomas for grade three, all of them neuroendocrine neoplasias. Surgery uh, is the only curative option, and adjuvant chemo radiotherapy could be considered in some grade three pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors after surgery. New targeted agents have erupted in the scenario of these patients where chemotherapy has still a role, and the, others, and the other treatment options are still there, so we need to create uh, good pathways, good guidelines to try to integrate all these uh, treatment options for patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And as I said before, grade three is a completely different disease. So we have the option of chemotherapy and no, uh, we have limited options after failure. Future will combine sure chemotherapy and targeted agents, but the investigation here is far compared with grade one and grade two neuroendocrine tumors. So, so we need to uh, increase our efforts here. And thank you so much for your attention.